but hopefully, um, you know, folks can kind of get a sense of who I am and um, how hopefully I can help you. So, you know, when I was asked to do this, I, you know, and, and everyone can see my slides. Yes, I just wanted to make certain I'm kind of looking at the, I guess I just, and I can only see the chat from, from here. So hopefully, yes. awesome, thank you. Okay, so yeah, I, when I, when I was asked to, you know, this is kind of not really a workshop, but kind of maybe, hopefully there's some useful information. The first thing that came to mind was building the artist toolkit. And so that's why it's, you know, the talk is named this, but before I get into that, you probably, you know, it would be helpful to know, you know, who, who are you, you know, who is Dorothy and, um, uh, but yeah, I'm a writer, artist, educator. Uh, I'm an open source software advocate. So it is true. I am the executive director for processing foundation. So uh, I definitely get to work with a lot of new media and digital artists. Uh, but I'm also a tarot reader uh, outside of you know school, and um, and it's I'm also simultaneously, even though I'm teaching, I'm also simultaneously a student because I'm in uh, grad school and finishing up or trying to finish up my PhD in film and digital media, and I'm getting a designated emphasis in computational media. So the best way to kind of sum up my bio is um, I fall more into the digital media side. If I do film anything, it's uh, typically I'm writing film criticism about science fiction uh, and horror and because I love those genres. And um, and yeah, so that those are the things that I that I kind of do. And then the computational media part of it is mostly me working with um, you know, different, I don't like, we don't like calling them developers at Processing Foundation, but different contributors in the open source software space. So that's who I am. And you will, the, me, me as a child holding the phone will make more sense as I um, get through this, but this is the fastest artist talk on planet earth that I've ever given. Um, I wanted to give you a sense of what I do so that we can talk a little bit more about, um, you know, how do you work on an artist statement? How do you overcome, you know, uh, creative blocks? How do you, you know, think about the critique process. And so obviously what I've done in my own practice, I've, you know, I also don't, my pedagogical approach is I don't, I don't assign what I haven't done. So a lot of um, what I've assigned in Art 175, and I think maybe Colin Zuka can attest to this, I, I've done all those exercises myself. Um, but this is a project that I worked on, Press One to be Connected. It was during an artist residency where I created an interactive fiction piece. It is part of a larger body of work, which I'll talk about um, a little later. It is based off of clinical trial study documentation, um, such as the informed consent form, because prior to returning to uh, grad school, I actually worked in biotech for 14 years. Um, listening is a modality that I'm really a huge fan of. I love sound, art, sonic experiences of any kind. I feel in a lot of ways, uh, listening is a very intimate experience. And, you know, you can't, as one of my favorite sound scholars talks about, like, you, Jonathan Stern, you can't, you can't hear yourself hearing. You know what I mean? It's just one of these magical senses that we have that I oftentimes feel we take, um, sometimes take for granted. Uh, but I also have a fascination with interactive voice response systems. Um, my, my dissertation is actually on voice and speech recognition uh, technologies and assistive tech. Just like letting people in, so hopefully that's okay. <laughs> Um, but this is a screenshot of a prototype that I did for Press One to be connected. Um, I did this in Twine. It is labeled informed dissent because I kind of used this prompt for myself. Well, what if I created something where I gave options to someone but provided this track somewhere, this subplot in the story that I'm building out that was um, atypical of what they might experience in, in real life? So, you know, if you have all the information, what would it be like to dissent from all of the information or, or the knowledge or the resources that have been given to you? I kind of use that as a prompt for my own writing. So this, yeah, what you're looking at now, uh, the video text phone, this was actually on the cover of uh, Byte magazine in 1984. And I became very obsessed with how illustrators back then were positing this kind of future of haptic technologies. And this kind of reminded me of um, the, the Minitel that was really uh, popular, you know, Kind of a dummy terminal um, in France. And this was kind of a solution. You know, it's a kind of one 
it's a one way it doesn't have it doesn't have interaction on it you know but it was a speculation like okay what if we had this video text phone in the future that could tell us you know um news and we can you know check our email etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh back in 2019 i became obsessed with this and then i ended up actually making my own and i worked with um Steve Thompson, who's a fabricator, and um, Alex Rebin, who is, an, you know, he's an engineer, but he is an artist. And they worked on kind of gutting the phone and creating a piece that, you know, uh, where you like lift up the receiver and can hear me narrating a story. So this is a part of this larger project that I brought up earlier, Do No Harm, that I started back in 2017. So things take time, <laughs> but it is a four part piece. So there is a part, there's a book art piece to it. it is an interactive fiction format that will have a web interface. It also incorporates a lot of audio recordings and um, press one was the kind of the first iteration of it that, um, you know, if anyone's interested in listening to it, I can totally send it out. So now onto the practice part of it all. So the artist statement, um, anyone who's taking art 175, y'all know I get really excited over emojis. That's why I was like, you know, kind of super excited to see all of the submissions. And you know, I didn't even know that there was a, a contest for it amongst the cadre. So, so that was really delightful. But I feel in a lot of ways, these emojis we kind of encapsulate how I feel about our, my own artist statement. You know, there's kind of fear. There's like, oh, why do I have to do this? And then there's shock, like, do I really like, cause this is just making me feel all the way anxious. But the last one, you know, kind of the growing nose of the, um, of the uh, smiley or emoji, I think it kind of, for me, represents this idea of imposter syndrome. I think a lot of people, a lot of artists don't like writing artist statements because they think to themselves, well, how am I gonna describe myself? Um, and for whom am I gonna describe my artwork and my practice to? Um, art can be very personal and it can be a very intimate experience in, in the making, but also in the showcasing of it. So one of the things that I thought of was, well, what are the types of things that you know, you would have to consider and remember when you're writing your artist statement. Um, and please feel free in the chat to, because I'm gonna, obviously I'm trying to get through this as much as possible because I really wanna talk to you all um, and have a, you know, dialogue about this. But in the chat, feel free to share how um, the artist, writing an artist statement makes you feel because <laughs> I would actually be interested to see um, how you've gone about that process to date and, how you're feeling about it, uh, if there's trepidation in writing an artist statement, like why is that? You know, you could share those things in the chat. But the three things I thought about were your statement is ever evolving. So your statement at SJSU as a DMA student, most of you I think are DMA, but uh, even if you're doing your undergrad or you're working on your MFA, your statement is gonna change, <laughs> you know, uh, every year, every opportunity that you get uh you know you're gonna have an evolution that's occurring in your own practice and i say this because you have to build in time to revisit your statement and then the hint that i have here is you know when you meet major milestones you know thinking about the artists writers mentors scholars that you know have deeply influenced and impacted your practice they are gonna find you know the, the those tendrils and the, the the rhizomatic nature of how you are making and doing your artwork is it's you're not, I hope you're not going to be the same artist and you're not going to be the same person from like year one to year four. So that's just something to remember. Um, I also say this because, you know, uh, in the, it, kind of with the next bullet point, you know, what themes are you exploring? And when I say keep a journal and I say, let me explain that. Um, you know, some people, they use Instagram because they, you know, they're, that's their way of tracking you know, what's happening artistically for themselves. Uh, some people use Twitter, some people use Arena, like there's different modalities and different platforms that you can use. Uh, you don't have to stick to a Google, you know, G doc or like a spreadsheet unless you want to and make it creative. But I say this because these are the very things like logging your progress, no matter what you're doing, even if you don't consider it a milestone, put it on, put it somewhere document it so that you can add further to the way that you're thinking about your artist statement and then the last bullet point about artist statements is that okay you're still stuck well here's a prompt for you i want you to imagine someone that you trust so it could be your best friend it could be your collaborator it could be a mentor etc and how might they describe your artistic practice 
So having them describe your work is actually very important because they know you, they probably have um, like you and this really kind of close person or someone that you deeply trust, you know, you have, you have built up a relationship where hopefully they can be honest and you can, you know, really expand upon the things that they share with you. And I, as I put on the kind of last thing, it's like a caveat is, you know, you have to be prepared to hear, uh, to listen to what you might hear and be open to it. So that, that's kind of regarding an artist statement. Now, over, over, overcoming creative blocks is really different. Obviously, I think we all think about what it means to like feel blocked. And I think, you know, we don't live in a time right now that is, uh, it's very abnormal or like atypical to what we're all used to. I think I've said this before in Art 175 and even amongst my own collaborators and, and you know, my chosen family and my friends and, you know, colleagues is, um, you know, I would prefer to be in the classroom. And so sometimes I feel in a lot of ways, I've had to get even more creative with my own uh, pr artistic practice. So some of the things that I wanted to share uh, about creative artist writer's block is um, taking a big idea that you have and then breaking it up into smaller parts and then building from there. I feel like a lot of the stuff I'm gonna share with you seems obvious, but I think it's a really good reminder to remember that if you are working with, okay, let's just take for instance, like, like someone in the chat, give me a big idea. What do you think a big idea means? Um, I'll wait, <laughs> or you can unmute and, and share too. Writing your own programming language. Ah, okay, that's a good one. So writing your own programming language, I think of uh, an artist uh, that I really deeply admire, Max Kremensky, and I feel like I, I say their name all the time because I'm so uh, impacted and influenced by the work that they do. Um, they, they, they have joked on Twitter that they accidentally wrote a programming language. <laughs> and so I think in a lot of ways, um, how might you do that, you know? And what does it mean to break it into smaller parts? Well. What's the purpose? What's the intent? Who's gonna use it? Uh, what do you want to see made with it? I think oftentimes in technology, the, the frustrating part for many people is that um, there is not a lot of that front end work um, in the ethics part of building, you know, whatever. I mean, you could machine learning, artificial intelligence, even the platforms that we use from, fake, well, now it's not even called Facebook, Meta, whatever, you know, you you know, you have to actually think about the repercussions that it's going to have on the various communities that you serve or that you feel accountable to. So if you're thinking about something that big, where, how about, or how might you start with the ethics of that project, you know, um, and again, breaking it down to intention um, and, and like, yeah, and who you might serve. And again, what you, what they might make you know, with what, uh, with what you've created. Um, oh, it's interesting, you know, like, so emotion, these are actually all really good. I think I'll do one more. This is so, this is good for my brain, but let me, cause I think starting a game studio and making a game, they're, def they're definitely related, but it's kind of a similar uh, approach. Um, you know, what is an idea that is top of mind for you? And then, breaking it down to how you see it in your everyday life. I think a lot of people forget that, you know, you have to actually make it's this is very similar case when you're writing is you have to write what you know. I don't know if how many people have heard that, but writing what you know, show don't tell. And a lot of it is because, you know, you're breaking down this whole environment and this whole world for your reader. And the same thing happens in the art world. You have to think in terms of, you know, um, those parts uh, and even, oh my gosh, I forgot the, the science fiction writer. Um, I can send it to you. Uh, I really wanted to quote her, but I, there was a science fiction writer who said that um, one of the ways that she thinks about, and this relates to how you might break down into smaller parts, like starting a game, for instance, is um, what's, and this is, you know, trigger warning, but like, what's the most deplorable thing your character can do? You know, and she, she would actually say that she would start a lot of her short stories and novels by making her character the villain. Because from there, everyone wants 
a villain or a character or subject matter to be good. That, but then forgetting that we do live in a world that uh, has kind of a shadow side to it. So that's how she breaks it down into smaller parts. And this kind of leads to the next bullet point, which is messy writing, making, building. I think something that I hear a lot of students talk about is there, there's kind of an engagement of like, I have this, I have this idea, I really want to do it. But then there is this almost like, there is like this debilitating feeling of, but it's not going to end up the way, how do I make it feel and look and, and, and be what is already in my head? And the thing that I want to encourage and almost overemphasize is what is in your head is it's never going to come out the way that you imagine. And a lot of that is because in the creative process, your mind is going to change. You're going to gain more knowledge. You're going to interact with, you know, you're going to interact with people who play it or experience it in a very distinct way. Um, this also kind of relates to having an accountability buddy, like how might you have check-ins with your creative process? And this also then again, relate this kind of, you know, is a good segue to then carrying the momentum of your creative practice and feedback outside of the institution walls. Now, the next thing I'm going to talk about is, um, is a critical response process that if you wanted to start within, you know, you could do it in cadre. So I think it's somewhat difficult in classrooms. Um, you know, but I think it's worth trying and it does take practice to do it. But I think this is something I feel oftentimes I don't see. Yeah, I think a lot of artists and, and writers, they will make something for class. They will make a project for, you know, a, a gig. You know, they got a gig, you, I'm gonna make this project. But if it's something you're really passionate about, and sometimes I get it, you know, it's, it's very hard, especially to divorce kind of being in school, working, trying to get the good grades and then trying to produce something that's really meaningful to you. And you know what? Not everything is going to carry that meaning, but it is a practice. And so, you know, how you carry that momentum of what you learn, even if it's a tough lesson, I hope that you, none of you stop, you know, writing and building um, just because, you know, school's out, just because it's, you know, um, you know, it's, I don't want to, I don't want to encourage like being overproductive. Trust me, I think everyone deserves rest. But I guess what I'm saying is, where can you find those creative moments outside of where you're expected to be creative, if that makes sense? Um, I feel I do this a lot because this is the thing that's helped me. And I know most people will be like, how is that going to help me? But using past assignments, exercises, and projects. And I say that because a lot of what I've learned when I, um, when I was working on my master's uh, there were a lot of exercises that I actually went back to and revisited, refined, and have the Art 175 students do them. Um, because I, number one, I had to do them, but it kind of gave me a different perspective. And I think the results of, you know, collecting all of this information over time and in your practice will bode well in the long run. Even if you don't want to become a teacher, even if you don't want to be, you know, someone that is, you know, um, giving, you know, because I, I, I trust me, artist talks can, you know, they're, you know, they can be a little bit, you know, irksome, because <laughs> sometimes you, you don't, you know, you'll be asked to do them. But I think a big part of it is, again, a part of this practice of how you've shown up over time. And that's kind of the reason why I'm mentioning um, going back to the things that you've done over not just at SJSU, but even before that, you know, what, you know, I, I feel that people need to understand that you have these past selves, you know, like you have a junior high self, you have a high school self, soon to be for some of you, you're going to have this kind of undergrad college self. And, you know, what have you learned? I think sometimes people don't carry on, they don't realize that, that you're building upon your life experiences until, you know, to revisit that from time to time. And if you're still stuck, here's a prompt for you. And this actually, I've done this, is grab your favorite book or your favorite media. So it could be a film or music video. I, you know, double check the media. So if it's like a 400 page book or like 120 minutes and then pick a number, go to that page or go to that minute of that media and then uh, write or make or build something in response to that thing that you're witnessing. Um, so I have a ton of these, by the way. So if you could just like, you know, 
message me on, you know, um, Discord and I'll, I'm more than happy to talk through them. But I'm going to try to get through this really quickly. But Liz Lerman's critical response process, it comes from the anti-racist writing workshop, uh, How to Decolonize the Creative Classroom by Felicia Rose Chavez. And it is a book mostly about kind of how you are in dialogue with others about um, your artistic practice, their artistic practice. Um, but you know, while there is this focus on writing practices because Chavez has her MFA in writing, I think one of the fundamental things that she talks about that has become even really important in the way that I engage in other people's um, practices and critiques is Liz Lerman's critical response process. So it's a four-step process and the first step is, you know, offering statements of meaning. So instead of saying, I like something, because you want to refrain from liking and you want to, you want to really practice what it means to like give and receive when you're in, um, when you're in critique. Um, I don't like calling it critique or crit, but, you know, that's the language and lexicon that we're, you know, accustomed to, obviously. But statements of meaning, you have to ask yourself. Um, when you're looking at a person's work uh, or an artist's work, well, what is stimulating about it? What's surprising? What's evocative, et cetera, et cetera. And offer that up um, instead of saying, I like because X, Y, Z. Um, it does take practice. It's, you know, this is something that happens over time. Uh, but the second step of the process is, you know, the artist posing questions. So what would it look like to have the artist come up with craft-based questions. So again, not too broad, like, what do you think? Or not too specific, you know, does this typography detract from the background image in this frame? But maybe expressing the question uh, or stating the question, well, what themes are being conveyed in the work? How does the use of like glitch aesthetic detract or distract? Or does it add to the work? So you as an artist, when you are asking uh, your, you know, your collaborators, or you're asking if you're, if you are a part of an artist collective, this is a way to kind of do that because, you know, the, you yourself as an artist are coming up with questions that you, you might, the answers might actually, not only will you glean how you might change or how the work might evolve, you are actually in active conversation with your, you know, with your colleagues, essentially. And then the third and fourth are, the, so the third is respondents pose neutral questions. So how would you categorize your voice, style, aesthetic in this particular work, whether that's a painting, interactive experience, et cetera. And I think in a lot of ways, the way that Chavez writes about this, and, it, you know, and obviously she's, you know, describing Liz Lerman's practice of doing this. And Liz Ner Lerman is a choreographer, FYI. Um, but she found that, you know, this practice of uh, response, uh, this response process actually works across different artistic disciplines. But again, when you pose neutral questions like that, it's not, it goes beyond the liking and disliking of work. You actually get to the heart of what um, a person is actually responding to or how the work is emotive or how it is different different from maybe other things that they've seen. And then the last step of it is, you know, participants raise permission opinions. So this step is actually what Chavez calls preserving the artist's power. So I have an opinion regarding the title. Do you want to hear it? Um, or may I share a thought regarding the use of imagery throughout this particular series that you presented? And the, it gives the artist a way of saying, you know, I don't, I'm not really focused on that right now, but maybe in the future I can hear you out. Or you can say as an artist, yes, actually I'm interested. I would love to hear your opinion regarding the title. Um, but again, this takes practice. So I just wanted to end here. I, I know that, you know, um, there's so much, ah, okay. Cause I want, I want to talk to y'all, but I think it's really important to also understand that just because I'm presenting to you uh, my, my practice and process. I wanna kind of recognize the, you know, the artists in my life that have actually deeply inspired the work I do as well as scholars. And sorry if my cat will probably get on screen and join the conversation. But, um, you know, Tana Tucker, Vivian Sming, Elizabeth Travelslight, Shawe R. Wang, Soraya Murray, who's a very prominent game scholar for anyone who's um, interested in um, game studies. Uh, she is the chair of my dissertation committee. Lauren Lee McCarthy, who is a colleague and dear friend and collaborator, also the, you know, um, the creator of P5.js, and also just a quick shout out and reminder to folks, because I think it might have gone out on the Cadre Lab distribution list, but Lauren Lee McCarthy is actually visiting the Art 175 class. Um, this coming Monday, and she will be giving an artist talk 
for um, the last hour. So the class is from uh, four to 6.50. So she's gonna be taking up um, the six to seven o'clock time slot. And then, uh, you know, Anshalmina, Joanne Rondilia, who actually teaches in ethnic studies at San Jose uh, State, along with Heather Dewey Hagbord, Indira Allegra, Christina Corfield, Helen Cheng. These are the individuals in my practice that really model a lot of what I've already shared with you. But thank you so much for your attention and like, let's talk, let's have a dialogue. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about my practice with you all. Oh, okay, I'm just looking at the chat now. I'm glad, I'm glad Cole that writing has helped to understand the design of your, of your BFA project. That's really wonderful to hear. Um, and Zuka, are you asking me for final assignment ideas or are you asking everybody else? No, no, when you mentioned the, the idea about um, flipping a book and then responding to that specific passage in it, I thought that was really smart. Oh, yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the things that I, I, I feel in a lot of ways, and then may, maybe this is also just the byproduct I grew up, um, I do have like half siblings, but we never, we, none of us grew up in the same household. So I grew up as an only child and I felt that my mom would always, like I could never say I'm bored to my mom because she would just give me things to do. <laughs> so I almost feel that a lot of what I've learned is from those moments, you know, like how can I turn this thing into a game? How can I flip this thing sideways and look at it from a different perspective. Um, but yeah, I have, I have a ton of prompts for y'all if you, if you really want them or need them for final projects. But um, yeah, I, I guess I'm most curious about um, if you have any questions regarding the things that I shared. And you can also ask questions about, um, you know, processing foundation if you want, or um, or pro other projects I'm working on, I'm more than happy to share. Uh, would you be able to share the slides with us? Um, there was a lot of information and I, I was just like, oh, that's a lot to read, but like, it's so good. Like even like what Zuko was saying about like looking at like the different media that like we have, I was like, I've never thought about that before because there's so much stuff like we watch TV or like, you know, like reading books and stuff like that. And like, there's so much stuff that we could make our own projects on based off of those things. Um, yeah. So that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. I mean, it's interesting because, um, I mean, this isn't, I mean, if you search my social media, none of what I share, I never want it to be a surprise to anyone, but uh, I am actually, because I did, I did, it's not even divulging, but you all know I shared in my intro that I'm a tarot reader. So I've been reading since I was a teenager, you know, so it's like over 20 years ago, I've been reading tarot. And what's really interesting about that practice is uh, it is very kind of, you know, witchy occult stuff that I'm also, I find utterly fascinating, but, you know, I think I just find inspiration everywhere. You know, I'm actually, I mentioned the occult slash tarot practice because I'm actually co-teaching a workshop on Halloween, actually about, uh, you know, um, welcoming lineage and honoring kinship. And so how do different types of practices, whether you're into astrology, whether you're into tarot cards, runes, whatever, um, how those different types of frameworks and ideologies actually affect the way that you see family um, and, you know, different identities. You know, some people don't even celebrate birthdays. Um, some people, you know, imagine our elders who don't, who did, there's my cat, who didn't have the technology to even, um, you know, um, like log their, their time of birth, for instance. And I feel if, if there's anything I would want moving forward for DMA students or folks that are working in digital, kind of almost exclusively in digital spaces, that there was, and when I say before times, I'm not talking about coronavirus or COVID, I'm talking about before times of the technology that you use. And I feel that there's a different way, that's, that in and of itself is a prompt 
So like when you are working, so like Steve is teaching, I think Steve, you mentioned you're teaching P5 or processing one of your classes. That is correct. So yeah, so like, let's say Steve is, is has an assignment or is teaching you a particular function within, um, you know, uh, you know, processing or whether it's P5. And I think different personalities kind of, because even for me, programming doesn't come naturally. I do know how to code very basic things, but, and I think a lot of it is the way that I started learning code was, oh, you know, how do I make a story out of the actual, you know, lines of code? Um, why would a certain function be important for me as like, say a writer who wants to make an interactive text, you know, experience using say P5 <clears throat> and, exploring that like you know because sometimes I feel learning programming um and I think maybe this is the reason why I never became like an engineer even though I had I, I actually wanted to but I was told that I'm not smart enough <laughs> um unfortunately by by teachers when I was younger um but now learning it there's a part of me that kind of flips it like flips the the way that I learn it in a different way you know um I've kind of, I've led workshops for people who are, you know, advanced coders. I mean, I've, I've led those types of workshops for people who do creative code. And I remember one workshop, I asked them, I asked the participants, well, what's your favorite line of code? And I'm like, I've, I've never been asked that. <laughs> and uh, my one was cons console log, because as a writer, that just makes sense like that. How could I not, if I could have a console log button in my life, you know, I almost feel people would understand me better as a writer and like, you know, and especially as someone who does poetry, you know, but, um, but anyway, yeah, sorry. I'm like kind of going off now. <laughs> I'm kind of curious. Um, and again, feel free to unmute or, you know, put this in the chat. I'm, I'm curious how, how you're feeling, how you're all feeling about artist statements um, or even professionalization. Like, are there things that you kind of feel like, why do I have to learn that? Or why is this important? You know, um, and I want this to feel like an open and safe space. I don't, cause trust me, if you think it, I probably have thought it and thought it a hundred times over. I'll bring up something, Dorothy. Yeah. You were uh, talking about, which I thought was really cool, talking about how to uh, reframe questions so that they're um, they're both, uh, you know, sort of more probing, but also, um, you know, not pointed. Or and I think there's the the fear I've seen certainly with students is that there's almost like this. Um, fear of retaliation or something like you're drawing attention to me and you start asking questions and and all this stuff and uh i, I think you uh you asked you actually made some really good suggestions or is there any other suggestions about this idea of how to enter dialogue with other students or people about the artwork that makes it so that everyone understands first of all it's in this context it's a learning environment and on top of just being able to talk about someone's art um, that we're talking about not just the two people maybe talking, but but everyone else who might be in earshot of the conversation. I don't know. You have, you have any thoughts about all that that dynamic of um, exposing yourself both as the artist, but the person asking questions about it? Yeah. No, that's a really great question. Oftentimes, I feel. I mean, it's functioned a little bit different in Art 175 with our studio, because usually Wednesdays are our studio days where, you know, an artist presents work. And typically I'm the one that's kind of engaging. And I did say, I did kind of, you know, market it that way that I wanted folks to feel that they could, they could participate when they wanted to engage with it, but that I would be the audience, right? right. And so trying to practice this also the 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 critical response process is also i have to say it's challenging in zoom it's challenging in the di digital space because right. you can't read body language i i can't you know and oftentimes i think 
that is a struggle that many people have. I think that's the reason why art for me, even digital, even being in the digital media arts department, it is very much an embodied experience that I wanna have, even if I am looking at a screen when I physically see someone. Um, but I'm talking, I'm kind of complaining about the state of the world we're living in. You that's know? all right, but, that's okay. <laughs> but in relation to Steve, what you're asking, you know, under the constraints of Zoom or like the digital space, is I really do try to ask, you know, students and collaborators, what do you see? You know, um, it's it's one thing to say you like something, but why do you like it? What is it? Or if you don't like something, I think it's also, you know, oftentimes it's not about um, being harsh and being competitive, but it is about saying, you know, this part of your project it's, um, it, 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 it causes a lot of um, tension. And it's because, you know, cause I actually had to, we had to do that. So uh, my own life experience, I took a seminar where we did have to critique each other's work. This was, you know, earlier this year actually. And one of the artists did a project on gentrification in San Francisco. She's not from San Francisco. You know, I'm born and raised in San Francisco. And you know, she finished her project, you know, she finished her project presentation, and it's a beautiful work, actually, like her watercolor paintings and the and the story that she's actually trying to tell through this interactive experience. It was aesthetically pleasing and, and it was quite a stunning, sophisticated project. But one of the things I said, because I felt like I needed to be respectful, but I felt like I needed to also give a critique, which was, you know, as someone who was born and raised in San Francisco, the tension that I feel with the work is how you are collecting the stories. How are you collecting them? How do you feel that that, how do you feel that the interface might detract or, um, you know, overshadow the reality of gentrification in San Francisco? So it is about asking, it's about taking the tension you experience and this takes practice. This is not something you have to just keep doing it. You just have to keep being in dialogue about your artistic practice. And again, be prepared to um, hear, you know, someone's tension or critique of work, but also it's okay to say, you know, to have um, dialogue about that tension. You know, it's okay to actually have a dissenting view or disagree, but you know, how might you go about that respectfully? Um, and it and it works. It works when you have compassion built into the way that you're delivering um, what might be, you know, challenging for you. So I don't know if that helps, Steve. I kind of feel like no, I no, it, it does, and it, no, it's okay. And and I think I was, I just think it's good to hear that because uh, I um, I was surprised. I have talked to several, you know, I, I one thing that um, sort of I kind of uh, championed is having alumni come every semester and mm -hmm. do presentations, just because I think this is a perennial interest of what this major, especially, um, you know, it's it's understandable you know, what, what am I going to do with this thing when I graduate? And so one of the things that I was sort of interesting, I asked a very simple question was, well, you know, uh, I talked to several graduates that had literally been gone from the program for over 20 years. And the like, and, you know, so much has changed since like the eighties and nineties and, and et cetera. And like, what is the thing that stuck with you? And I was really surprised more often than not, it was just being able to articulate and have conversations with other artists in a productive, constructive way. And it was like literally their verbal tools of being able to describe like both practical things like, oh, I think it should be over here on the left side of the screen versus this. And you know, whether they're talking to other designers or maybe an engineer and being able to talk about it so that it's not confrontational, that it's uh, that it's becomes creative problem solving instead of my agenda versus your agenda, or you know, I, I'm talking about the worst case scenarios, but. I was really surprised that like beyond coding, beyond, you know, other things I've had, you know, experiences with the computers, it was just these fundamental skills of like interpersonal communication, being able to articulate, you know, your ideas, learning enough about art and aesthetics that you can share your ideas in a way that people understand what you're talking about. And uh, you can make a career on that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. That's right. I mean, I think I also just, I think we are living in a time where there's so much historical, cultural, societal change. 
and there's there's ways to really think about you know how like art can be and I feel that's the thing that people forget you know and I if there's one thing I want to share with you all is that um you know though and this is no pressure and I'm really not trying to sound like you know a line from a Marvel movie but like the world needs you <laughs> you know like it really does I feel yeah. oftentimes you know, people will bring in artists and be like, okay, make this pretty, make this experience, like make it interactive. It's just like, no, you are beyond that. You actually, you, you have stories to tell. You have things that you can make that can actually affect change in the world. But I think that that sometimes is the issue and the problem that I have within like new media and digital art. You know, I think a lot of times there's this focus and concentration on what is sleek what is pretty looking what is it and you know there's tons of artists who make that work and they, they want it. and i'm not critiquing that what i am critiquing is that that becomes so commonplace in and almost as if that's what's expected and i i, I really wish that like even when I was an undergrad or even when I was working on my master's and even now getting a PhD, like there's a part of me that kind of feels, you know, something needs to change in the art world and the ecosystems. And, you know, it can actually start with y'all. Like you could, you could start it now. You don't, you don't have to, um, you know, uh, you don't have to wait, you know? <laughs> and, but um, I think, you know, I think if, because I, I noticed we only have 10 more minutes, but like, especially thinking about an artist toolkit, the reason why I talk about toolkit is because of Soraya Murray. So, you know, Professor Murray is someone that I have had a long time, you know, mentorship with. Um, and one of the things that she told me, you know, within the past year, when we're talking about like my work, my creative practice, my academic work, one of the things she said was, you know, it's like, it's the quiet work that nobody sees that oftentimes is the most impactful. And so you think that turning in a final project is like where it's at. That's not it, actually. It's what you do that leads up to the final project. And I wish more students and more people in the world knew that. I feel like that is something I, I, I if I were to impart anything of what I want you to remember in terms of like, writing an artist statement, you know, overcoming these barriers or what it feels to, to do a crit, even if with another person, like your best friend who's also an artist or whatever, that those are all like the little steps, you know, sometimes it's not, and it's so cliche to be like, like oh, you should really focus on the journey and not the destination, but that's kind of true, especially in the arts, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>